I was born in France, but my parents are Americans. And uh, I, my father's from Colorado, my mom's from New York, Connecticut. My parents like to travel, and uh, we, we moved back to Colorado when I was uh, like 1960 or so. And I grew up in, uh, in Denver and Durango, and then later in Montana. Uh, probably like you, I've always been interested in, in unusual things, esoteric, UFOs, Atlantis, Megaliths, Stonehenge, pyramids. Uh, I also have interests in cryptozoology, Bigfoot and Loch Ness Monster and giant snakes and, and, and a Nikola Tesla and anti-gravity, super science, Philadelphia experiment, all that kind of stuff. And, and I love to travel. Uh, megaliths and other unexplained things are, are really my probably my big interest and what I'm most known for. But I'm, uh, one of our best-selling books that we ever published, and I was the editor of, was a book called The Fantastic Inventions of Nikola Tesla. So I'm also a very interested in Tesla, and I like a lot of retro stuff, too. So the whole idea, too, and, and, and I know Robert's going to give a great presentation later about how old civilization is, and that, and that has always been a big question. Uh, for a long time, they said that Malta, and these ruins here at Malta and Giga Kija, the oldest ruins in the world, going back to around 7,000 BC or so. Uh, I mean, it's all controversial. This is a, a cave on Malta called the Dargalong Cave, where this giant tidal wave washed in all these pygmy elephants and pygmy rhinos and stuff on Malta. And it's like uh, Malta at that time probably wasn't an island, this little island off Sicily. And in fact, what the Mediterranean was like at that time, quite different, a bunch of lakes and stuff like that. There's over 200 known sunken cities in the Mediterranean. And so now they're, now mainstream archaeologists are saying that Gobekli Tepe is uh, now the oldest ruins in the world, going back around 9,000, 10,000 BC. And that's getting towards the time of Atlantis. I want to point out, too, like a Gobekli Tepe, which is kind of interesting, like that it's animals, foxes and lizards and other things like that, are, are carved on relief on these megalithic tea monuments at and go back with Tepe. We're going to see some more of that here coming up a little bit later. Things about go back with Tepe where it is, I'm going to not go into that too much. One of the more interesting ruins, too, with giant megaliths is at Baalbek in Lebanon. It has the largest cut stones in the world that we know of today at the uh, Trilithon. Uh, these stones are weighing over a, a thousand tons. Um, just exactly how and why any ancient people would want to carve, move, construct with such gigantically huge blocks of stones is a complete mystery. Archaeologists can't really explain it, but they have to somehow. And uh, they, I mean, this is probably with mainstream archaeology, they, although in, in many cases they just try to ignore things that they can't explain. With Baalbek, here's how a French archaeologist, uh, he said, okay, here's how you're going to move these thousand ton uh, megalithic blocks that are the size of a railway car. Well, you build this giant cage around it. You have these little hourglass type uh, notches in the top, and then you put these wedges in it, and you have all these pulleys and stuff like that. And then when you're all said and done, you're going to move this thing a couple of inches. And, and then you start all over again, and then now raising it on top of a platform. So it's really pretty clear that, uh, in my mind, yeah, they had to have, this couldn't have been so difficult for them. It must have been actually easy for them to do these things uh, without thousands of slaves and people dragging things, that they have anti-gravity and stuff like that. This is the uh, Osirion, which is at Abydos in, in southern Egypt near Luxor. Uh, the Osirion is interesting because it's actually adjacent to a dynastic Egyptian temple uh, called Abydos. The Osirion has all these unusual... Um, giant granite blocks, and there's no hieroglyphs or anything like that written on them. And it has the curious notching and, and things like that that we're going to see in these knobs, stuff like this. this these, they're, they're not just square blocks. They often have these notching, the Z's and stuff like that in them. And that's a lot like uh, this, what you see in South America. And this, this is a wall in, uh, in Cusco, actually, here. And you get the jigsaw 
puzzles, the, the jigsaw fitting of, of blocks together, and uh, more, um, more of these kind of uh, polygonal, cyclopean uh, masonry together. And now this is a place which is very much like what you see at Cusco, but it's actually uh, the Necromanticon in, in northern, northwest uh, Greece, up near the Albanian borders. It wasn't discovered until 1960, it's actually under <coughs> But it also has all this, this jigsaw polygonal placing of these stones, and uh, it, again, they're perfectly fit together. Can't really get a, a razor blade or a knife and stuff in them. This is the Emperor's Palace in Tokyo. And it too is built uh, out of this polygonal, perfectly placed uh, <coughs> uh, megalithic construction. And the Emperor's Palace in, in Tokyo too is, is probably much older than, uh, than, than it's attributed to be, only probably maybe a thousand years old or something. It's, it's probably many thousand. And that's part of the thing with this kind of construction is that you, it's, it's indestructible in many cases, although it has been destroyed in some cases where uh, the Spanish dismantled it, like here at Sacsayhuaman, because it's right above uh, Cusco. <laughs> and uh, it's built largely out of limestone. Uh, Spanish and Incas fought a big battle here. But it's this kind of construction, too, when you have big earthquakes that are coming through, and the wave of an earthquake is hitting a wall. The walls, because there's no mortar in it, the walls move and jumble. This is an aerial photo of, of Saxon Woman. So, uh, so the stones are, are locked in together. And uh, the opposite of this kind of construction would be brick construction, where you have uniform uh, bricks, and, or say small blocks of stone, cinder blocks or something. But they're all even in rows. And so you, you can have a shearing effect when the um, earthquake hits it. The, the bricks or stones are not locked in together, like you see here. But the stuff you see in, uh, in around Sacsayhuaman is pretty interesting. This is also near Sacsayhuaman, where uh, you have these upside down uh, walls and staircases. Uh, it's almost like somebody's come in here uh, with their plasma cutting tool or power tool or something, and, and they're just cutting away at this thing, and, and for no real reason. I mean, it doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, mainstream archaeologists say, well, these were the Inca stone masons. They just went over there to practice, you know, their, their stone cutting <laughs> skills and stuff like that. But they're making these, you know, very sharp edges and, and clean um, corners and things like that. And it's the kind of thing that you're going to look at it when you're looking for power tools, these, these inside corners and things like that. I mean, these are the things that you just can't do with with a copper chisel or, or just bashing something out with a rock in your hand, which is basically how they say they did these things. Um, stone hammers, things like that with, with chisels. The Incas too, uh, or whoever be prior to the Incas, they would cut tunnels and things like that through uh, solid rock. Uh, there's all kinds of interesting stories too, which I go to in my book on Peru and Bolivia about these secret tunnels. Uh, the lost treasure of the Incas being stored in this vast tunnel system underneath Sacsayhuaman and Cusco. So the mainstream archaeologists are saying, yeah, you know, we, it's just a matter of getting enough guys uh, hauling and, and, and just pulling on these giant blocks to kind of, kind of put them into place. And, and in fact, there is there's something to that in the sense that there's a formula. If you just get, you know, a thousand guys or whatever like that pulling on a, some giant stone, it will move. But the problem is in a lot of those cases, and particularly in Peru, um, there's, they can't find where all these people would stand because these, these, these cities are on knife edges of ridges and stuff like that, or Yonge Tambo or Machu Picchu. I mean, there's just not the place for thousands of people to be hauling and pulling up on roads. Machu Picchu is a megalithic city and a secret city uh, that's high up in the Andes. It's, it's also a perfect construction, this kind of knobs again, uh, which we saw at the Osirion. Uh, some un really unusual buildings at Machu Picchu, huge lichen patches. Uh, to me, the most interesting place in, in Peru is Ollanque Tambo. Uh, and uh, you go to the Sun Temple, which is up on top of this night ridge up here. You can see how it is on the edge of like cliffs and stuff. And this is one of the places where <coughs> 
the, the stonemasons are trying to figure out, okay, you know, how did they build this? Uh, where did all the people stand? You know, hauling the blocks up. And they can't figure that out. Uh, so, you know, the, even, the, even the experts who are, the, the mainstream experts are talking about this. I mean, they admit it. You know, it's just like, well, we just can't explain it all.